Hi, today I'm doing section 8 of chapter 3. It's equivalent fractions and lowest terms. Some of the stuff's probably going to be review from things that you knew before, um, in which case if you know it clearly, you don't need to write it down. But I'm just going to talk a little bit where you write that down, 3 8 equivalent fractions, lowest terms. So the first part that I'm guessing is going to be review. But important to know is just so you can keep up in the notes and in discussion in class, if you have a fraction, fraction always will have a top and a bottom, and we always refer to the top part as being the numerator. So the numerator is always going to be the top of the fraction, and the denominator is the bottom. It's kind of corny, but maybe one way to remember it would be, you know, if you build a house or build something, you start at the bottom and work your way up, and alphabetically, D comes before N. So that might be one way that you could remember it. The other fact about fractions that I want to talk about is... The other thing that I want to talk about with fractions would be that you can't ever divide by zero. Uh, so if you were to, the way I think of it, and I think I had manipulatives like this when I was a kid, but I think of it as far as a pizza goes. I'm writing all this here probably isn't going to make sense in this line. But say you have a pizza, you cut it into four pieces. If you get one of the four pieces, you just got one quarter or one fourth of the pizza. Um, if instead the pizza is cut into four pieces, but you get two of the four, you have two-fourths of the pizza, or you could reduce that and say that you just got half the pizza. Um, so you could do the same sort of thing with, well, maybe they cut the pizza into six pieces, and you get four of the six pieces, or something like that. Uh, you could reduce that as well to two-thirds. But So the bottom, the denominator, is always going to be how many pieces make up the whole, and the top is going to be how many pieces do you have. Um, so the point that I want to make is that you can't ever have a fraction with a zero in the denominator. And the pizza example breaks down a little bit because I have some people that say, well, you just don't cut it. Um, then you have zero pieces. But if you don't cut a pizza, you still have one piece. It's one really big pizza. Um, so it doesn't work. To, you couldn't say that you have zero slabs of pizza and you get one of them or you get four of them. You know that if you have zero parts, you can't get any of those parts. So what I'm really trying to say is you can't have can't have zero in the denominator of the fraction. So zero in the denominator. And if you happen to see that come up or you forget that, you could just try typing it into your calculator. Uh, with any decent calculator, at least anyone I've ever messed with, if you do 4 divided by 0, any number divided by 0, it's going to give you a, like a divide by 0 error or just say error. Um, or you could have 0 in the numerator. And if you think back to our pizza example, say I have a pizza, I cut it into 4 pieces, I give you 0 of the 4 pieces, how much pizza did you get? Well, you got 0. Um, so 0 is allowed in the numerator, but never in the denominator. So now if we're going to go on into hitting the stuff that's actually in the title, we could say Roman numeral 1 then, equivalent fractions. And really when we're talking about equivalent fractions, what we're really talking about is two fractions that are going to be equal. And tomorrow's notes, the 3, 9, is going to talk about how do you compare fractions as far as different sizes. But I'm just going to say, uh, what's my example? Um, oh, first of all, I guess if you're testing to see if two fractions are equivalent, so maybe you have things like the one half of a pizza we were talking about and two fourths. One way to figure out are those two equal would be to punch them both into a calculator. If you do that, the one half is going to give you a 0.5. If you do that with the uh, two fourths, it also gives you 0.5. So, so they both equal the same decimal value, you know then the two fractions are equal. Um, if you don't have the two fractions nearby, one way that you could check would be to say, well, what could I do to get my two to change into my four? And well, to change a two into a four, um, I could multiply by two, which would be one thing. And But if I'm going to take and multiply the denominator by two, I also must multiply my numerator by 2. And when I do that, you'll notice 1 times 2 is 2, and 2 times 2 is 4. So my two blue fractions have to be equivalent. And the reason that it works to say, well, if this left side equals the right side, is, well, when we look at 2 over 2, 2 over 2 is just 1. Again, if you think of the pizza, if you cut a pizza into two pieces, you eat both of the two pizza pieces, you just ate one whole pizza. So if you take a number and multiply it by 1, which is essentially what we did, this 2 over 2 is really just 
times 1. We don't change the value of our original fraction any because 1 is that multiplicative identity element. If you multiply by 1, you don't change the value. So ways to see if things are equal. 1, you could, or if two fractions are equivalent, 1, you could punch them into a calculator. Uh, 2, you could take and just try to change the one fraction into another. Uh, maybe a different type of question that you might get would be to say something like, what's a fraction that's equivalent to 3 fifths? So what's a fraction that's equivalent to 3 fifths? Doing it the calculator way would really be a pain in the rear. Um, because you could just start making up fractions. Well, divide 3 by 5 with your calculator, you get 0.6. Then you could start trying to figure out what are other numbers that would give you 0.6. And that could take you a while, um, unless you think about it and play your cards right. But, okay, anywho, so what you could do with the 3 fifths, though, is say, well, as long as I multiply it by some number over itself, then I'm essentially just multiplying by 1. So say I multiply both... 3 and 5 by 4, well 4 over 4 is just 1. So essentially I'm multiplying my fraction by 1, which doesn't change its value. 3 times 4 gives me 12. 5 times 4 gives me 20. So then 12 over 20 is going to be a fraction that's equivalent to 3 fifths. Um, you could, if you wanted to say find another one, you don't have to multiply, you could divide. Um, where if I take and divide, I actually don't want to divide by that. Say, if you divide the whole thing by 1, you're not changing its value any. Um, but maybe I divide the numerator and the denominator by 2. And again, doing the same thing to both. 2 over 2 is just 1, so I'm not changing the value of the fraction any. Um, so 12 divided by 2 is 6. 20 divided by 2 is 10. So all three of these blue fractions now are going to be equivalent or going to be equal. 3 fifths is 0 0.6, and so is 12 over 20 and so is 6 over 10. So for equivalent fractions, you could multiply numerator and denominator by some number, or you could divide numerator and denominator by some number. If you want to know why it works, the division at least, well, if you're dividing by a fraction, that's the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. Um, so then I could, in this case, dividing by 2 over 2 is the same as multiplying by 2 over 2, which is multiplying by 1. All right, if I were to then move on and say, next question maybe would be our two sevenths. So example two, our two over seven and 54 over 189. Are these two things equivalent? L kind of turn into a T a little bit there, but are those two equivalent? Um, you could with your calculator, if you had a calculator handy, you could try to figure that out. But another option, if you don't have a calculator, is you could say, well, what would I have to multiply my 7 by to turn it into 189? And unfortunately, that number probably doesn't pop off the page for most of us, but we could go over on the side if you're not allowed to use a calculator. And divide that by 7. So 7 doesn't go into 1, but 7 can go into 18 2 times. 7 times 2 is 14. So if I subtract that there, then I get 4 left and carry my 9 down, so I have 49. Ooh, 7 goes into 49 7 times with a remainder of 0. It goes in there evenly. So in other words, I just found I need to multiply 7 by 27. And if I do that, I get this 189. Well, if I'm going to keep my fraction equal, then I need to multiply the numerator as well. What I perhaps should have done, let me see if I can move these over a little bit, probably should have left myself a little bit more space to work. And here then, I could have tested it. Well, I know this is going to be 189, if I did my math over here correctly. And then you could say, well, 2 times 27, so 2 times 7 is 14. Then I have my 2 times 2, but I carried the 1 as well, so I get 54. So 54 does equal 54, 189 equals 189, so those two fractions are equivalent. So you could just say yes. Um, 
where if instead we'd come up with like a 52 in the numerator, then it's not equivalent because they have different numerators, but the same denominator. That's the first part of the section. Now, this is one way to do it. I wasn't sure exactly how to teach this because there's like tons of different ways that you could do it. So maybe let's look at one more and I'll go back to my two sevenths and my 54 over 189. Another way that you could do this would be to, well, what we did before, punch them both into your calculator, see if it's at the same decimal. That's assuming you're allowed to use a calculator. If you're not allowed to use a calculator, then you have to try to do some other things. Um, you could reduce both fractions in the lowest terms. Um, if you can look at these two and figure out what would work for both, that's going to help. And knowing those divisibility rules, uh, even odds, you can't divide them both by 2. 5 plus 4 gives me 9, so I could divide that by 3. 1 plus 8 plus 9 gives me 18, which is divisible by 3. So I could go through and reduce the fraction by dividing numerator and denominator by 3 and kind of keep working until they get into lowest terms. If you don't see that, um, you can reduce them that way. What you could do is you could go back and do a factor tree for both of them. So it's even, so I divide by 2. I have 27 left. I have now 27. How can I break that up? Well, that's going to be a 3 and a 9. I can break my 9 up into two more 3s. Um, now my 189, I could do a similar sort of thing. I know it's divisible by 3, so if you're not sure to do that in your head, you could jump over here. All right, well, 6 times 3 is 18, and that give me 0 left there. I pull down my 9, all right, I get a 63. So I still can't divide that by 2, but 6 plus 3 is 9, so I could divide it by 3 again. And then what do I have left? It's going to be 21. If you're not sure why, you could jump over here and, and do the math. You have the 2 minus 6, carry the 3, so 21. And then from there, 21, well, that's going to be a 3 times 7. And what I should have said when I first started this whole process of, you can figure out the greatest common factor. And to do that, one way is to do a factor tree. And then what you do is just see how many of those factors they have in common. So I have a 3, a 3, and a 3 in both. So you know the greatest common factor is going to be 3 times 3 times 3. So 3 times 3 is 9, times 3 is 27. So to reduce that or original fraction then, I could divide both of these by 27. And in doing that, that in one step will get you to the fraction in lowest terms. And um, essentially, I'm dividing by 1. So 54 divided by 27 is 2. And for this, that might be a little tougher, but if you kind of think like 25 is a quarter um, in your money, well, that's going to be a little bit more than $1.75, so it ends up being 7 quarters. Um, so these two fractions are equivalent because we just put them in lowest terms. That's it for this section.